literally the father I wish I had. Fantastic class. Professor Braun was one of the best teachers I've had at UMass. My favorite professor this whole semester, the nicest guy and so smart. Now, Professor Josh Braun is actually here to talk about the future of media, about ad fraud, about Google and, and uh, Meta's monopoly and things like that. But when I saw these reviews on, on RateMyProfessor.com, I just had to mention them. I mean, I would be just dripping with envy to even dream of being uh, 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 seen like that by your students. So, so uh, Josh Braun, welcome to this podcast. Well, that's incredibly kind of you, as it, as it was of them. I'm sure on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't know that my students are... Uh... <laughs> as the... well, I don't know about that. Look at the data. You got to... So. The only, unless you're giving them, you know, $20 handshakes, the only way you get reviews like that is to earn them. So, so well done. Uh, and, that, and that's great. And a lot of people don't know in academia, there's sometimes a stigma about uh, getting too favorable reviews as a teacher, because that means you should be focusing more on research. But I really respect people who, who, who make that connection with students. And you obviously do that. Well, really thank well. you so much. That's very kind. <laughs> My pleasure. So, Professor Braun, you're an associate professor of journalism at the University of Massachusetts. You are a widely published author on the topic of media, especially kind of the, the plumbing and the distribution, the, the nitty gritty. And you are also co-editor of a book series called Distribution Matters. So let's get to my first topic today, which is ad fraud. It's salacious and, and sordid salacious things tend to draw the attention of people. So let's start with that. Um, can you explain how the invention of cookies, the city of website tracking, has inadvertently created a situation where these fake uh, news websites, shady websites, scammy websites, whatever, can proliferate. Sure. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, this goes back to, uh, like, in the wake of the 2016 election. Um, so uh, I, I worked with a, a then student who's now, uh, like, a, now uh, in marketing, uh, Jessica Eklund, um, was, a, was my research assistant at the time. Um, and she had uh, she had a fascination with all things marketing and that kind of thing. It wasn't something that I had necessarily taken a huge interest in before. So I was looking, you know, I had this this really like great and en engaged um, student. I was looking for things that we could do together that would like sort of spark uh, like her interest. And a lot of the things that I had on deck were like lethally boring. So <laughs> at the moment there was uh, that was the moment though that like all of the news stories started coming out about the 2016 election. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and how, uh, a number of people or maybe many people had made, uh, like large sums of money, uh, off of, uh, basically running, uh, digital ads against, um, like inflammatory hoaxes, basically, you know, we initially called it fake news. And of course that term has gotten fraught in the interim. Um, but it, the, uh, but yeah, so I was, I think a lot of people were, were wondering, like, you know, is this something that could have swayed the election um, is, or like why do people share these things? Like sort of what, you know, like what are people's kind of media literacy practices? And those struck me as, you know, A, like topics that a lot of other people were working on and, and some in some cases things that might be really hard to answer. Um, as you mentioned, I'm kind of interested in the plumbing and infrastructure stuff. And so I was mostly curious about sort of what it was that... Uh, uh, how was that like you had these systems that were creating financial incentives for people to publish um, this inflammatory material? Um, and so, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, Jessica and I, we looked for uh, for a while at, at sort of at the, the ad tech ecosystem. And that's kind of how my interest in this got started. Um, and, you know, I mean, there's lots of different things that can be said about it. But I guess, you know, to jump to the to your, to your question about fraud, um, basically, uh, you know, it, it turned out that a lot of the, the sort of these uh, these hoaxes were kind of the bait or the clickbait <laughs> um, that were sort of uh, that was kind of forming the front for a number of different like ad fraud schemes. And the basic idea um, is that if you're running, um, if you if you put up a website, you can you know you can run ads against it by just basically putting in a widget or including. Um, an API. There's like pretty simple tools where you can basically um, run ads on that website that come and uh, like in an automated fashion. Um, and and there's no and for a variety of reasons, there's not necessarily a whole lot of eyes on sort of like uh, like on the the sort of quality of your site. Um, and so the uh, and so one sort of fraud scheme is basically to buy a bunch of 
fake traffic um, and uh, it, you know so bots, uh, click workers in developing economies, that kind of thing. Um, and direct them at, direct that fake traffic at your website. And as long as you are selling it to advertisers in these automated exchanges, so again, like automated buying, um, as long as you're selling uh, the automated traffic to automated buyers at more than you paid for it in the first place, you you turn a profit. It's, it's so it's an arbitrage scheme. Um, and so ad fraud, not just with hoax news, but more broadly, um, like sort of. Uh, is, is a huge problem in digital advertising. Um, so there's a firm called White Ops, uh, like where it used to be called White Ops, now called Human, that does a periodic audit of these problems. And their most recent report estimated, I think, that it was near like $6 billion globally um, in, in money that's lost to fraud. Um, and there's some really like sophisticated um, schemes uh, that it, they've caught. Like there was an FBI indictment a while back um, of a couple schemes called Eve and Methbot that kind of peeled back the curtain on how some of these things work. Um, but basically, it's uh, yeah, it's it's sort of it's a huge problem um, for the industry. It siphons lots of money away from legitimate publishers. Um, and so there's yeah, it's uh, it's it's an ongoing issue, um, and it's really it's it's also one that's really complicated to solve. Um, for a whole variety of reasons, so. <laughs> I would imagine. And so I mean, if I'm just some guy with a, a bird feeder business, let's say, in the old, and even without out of fraud, I make it just on the cookie point. I mean, in the old days, I would never dream of advertising in some, you know, you know neo-Nazi publication or, you know, some whatever it is, you know, whatever inflammatory thing, right? It'd be branding That's death. Right. But these days, you know, if somebody goes to the website, it's personalized, so not everybody would see my ad. If some you know, neo Nazi guy is happens to be a bird enthusiast and, and goes to that website, like he'll see my ad. Uh, is there any way that I could? I mean, it seems like it's pretty hard. I mean, I've done some online advertising. There are 32 million businesses in the U.S., and I think probably many of them have done online advertising. Is there any way businesses can 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 do something about this or not? Yeah. So I mean, it's uh, it, it's a great point. And so like, uh, yeah. So I mean, by by the nature of these things is is that it's you there's there's a lot of op opacity in the process. Um, so a typical ad buy will involve multiple sort of intermediaries. So you uh, you know when you're when you're like putting up your ad will connect to basically an automated auction called an ad exchange. Um, but you'll usually use a service like an intermediary service between you and the ad exchange to, to like to, to like sort of define your bidding strategy and the target and the target audiences that you want to reach. And on the other end, there's the publisher and they're connecting to the exchange through an intermediary. Um, and there's lots of other different services that you can use to like warehouse data on users and all sorts of other stuff to help you in, in, in ad targeting. So there's there's many different services that are connecting to one another, um, which creates a kind of opacity where it's really hard often to know exactly where your ad is appearing. Um, and as you're mentioning, like, you know, all this stuff is done now through behavioral targeting. So we're kind of after, you know, so uh, like, you know, contextual advertising is where you want to sell some shoes. So you're, you're adding a running magazine, right? And the publication is a good proxy for the people you want to reach. Um, but targeted advertising and like or behavioral targeting of the kind that we have now places all the emphasis on who the consumer is and are they at the moment where it seems like they're likely to buy something. Um, and so that's where all the emphasis goes at the expense of really considering sort of where an ad appearing. Um, and it's even tough to know where your ad is appearing in many cases. So there are a variety of tools that you can kind of use to sort of ward off this kind of thing. So, I mean, they do have brand safety firms that will identify like scalable white lists and stuff like that of like um, places where your ad can, or of like uh, publications where it's safe for your ad to appear. Um, you know, of course that cuts out lots of smaller publishers. Um, and then, so, uh, it, you know, the, uh, there are uh, like, and, and there are other kinds, there are other kind of verification services that sort of as a side project, like will sell like, you know, um, blacklists that they will keep you from appearing on mm. um, sort of inflammatory or, or hoax websites and that type of thing. I mean, the problem is like these sites are spun up constantly, like, you know, there's, there, there can be thousands of them cropping up all the time. Um, and so it's basically impossible to keep those kinds of blacklists like continually updated um, without having tons of more human review than is typically um, practiced at a lot of these firms. Um, some of them, are, you know, just uh, some of them are, you know, are, are, I mean, one problem in the industry is that you have kind of a bifurcated structure where you have like the enormous firms like Google um, or, you know, that, that don't have a whole lot of incentive to change because they have such a huge monopoly on the market. And then you have, uh, and then you have very tiny firms that are sort of living hand to mouth and can't afford a lot of additional protection. Um, and there's not a whole lot of stuff in between. And where there is, their their goal is to scale until they're purchased by a Google or something like that. So I think to your question, though, um, 
if you are the person who's selling bird feeder ads <laughs> and you want a, you want better performance, I, I think you know you can make use of these tools. It does, um, and, and it requires um, spending a little bit more. It, it will require spending a bit more money. I think one criticism of advertisers frequently is that they could get better. They could get better results if they just spent more of the money that they had uh, on this. Uh, like you know, it, it weren't like it, uh, uh, so if they're willing to spend more in the first place. Um, there are also some great resources. Um, so uh, check my ads is uh, is, is kind of is a um, a firm run by um, Nandini Jami and Claire Atkin. Uh, Nandini Jami is formerly uh, like one of the the uh, the activists behind Sleeping Giants, um, but basically they pay a ton of attention to what's going on in the space. They publish a newsletter called Branded that helps people keep on top of stuff like this. Um, and so so there's definitely ways to, to sort of uh, to sort of keep on top of industry trends and so forth that they can make your ad buys. Um, a bit safer. Um, there's, uh, and then I mean, like, and the, uh, like as I mentioned before, I mean, contextual advertising is 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 a great way to do this as well. You know, I think just paying attention to where the publications that your ads are going into, um, and buying using a publication as a proxy for audience is still a good move. I think. Uh, you know, I think there have been studies done. I'm going to forget the names of the researchers at the moment, but I can. I'm happy to, to forward you the citation later on. Uh, there was a study at one point that like sort of the benefit of doing all this targeted advertising over contextual advertising um, was was actually not that substantial in some cases. So so I think, you know, like uh, if you want your ads to appear in safe places, then, yeah, using the public, you know, using mechanisms that take the publication as the proxy for your audience is still a good move. So the, the old fashioned. Exactly, direct buy. Yeah. Uh, now, you mentioned Google being a monopoly, and, and you're certainly not the only one to mention that. And although the, the contextual advertising or the, the, the sorry, the cookie based model has brought down ad rates in many cases, uh, Google and, and Meta still have a lot of power. And I know this because I worked in the investment newsletter industry for, for about two decades. And there are times when they just turn off the spigot and say, you know, ad rates are too high. We just got to like not market for the next six months or eight months. Um, should these two companies be broken up? We, uh, so Google and what, Meta was the other one, or, or yeah, yeah. I, I think I mean, I think it depends. It, it depends on kind of what your what your objective is. I, I think that um, I, I at one point I, I saw a fun um, a fun social media post uh, from from a, a uh, from an angel investor or something like that who was saying that you know. That the critics of these companies, um, you know, they just like the policymakers, the academics, they just don't understand billion scale systems, right? And, and there's two ways to take that. One is that we're painfully naive about stuff, but the other is why well, have billion scale systems? <laughs> you know, are there are there you know are there situations where like you know we could be better served by having a, a lot of small companies as opposed to a few big a few big ones? Um, and, you know, like, and so I think there are some problems that like when things are compartmentalized in that way, uh, you know, when something goes horribly wrong, <laughs> you know, people who study like failure in organizations will tell you like sometimes it's better to have things partitioned in that way so that things don't, or they're, don't, don't spread like a contagion. Um, but I mean, there certainly are uh, like sort of benefits to, to scale. I was talking with somebody from Facebook recently who talked about the fact that if you that like if you're talking about like trust and safety and the people who are like trying really hard to moderate these platforms, I mean there are there there there's not just a, an endless pool of talent in the way that some people think they are. They think there is that you know if you're if you're somebody who pays a lot of attention to these issues and is really like you know good at at, at, at being thoughtful about moderation and sort of and and, and weeding out like um, really like and dealing with really thorny problems. That that sort of that, that that talent pool is relatively small, and so if you broke these companies up, you might not a lot of you, they might not have access um, to that level of talent. Um, so uh, at, at the same time, a lot of the people who abuse these systems are going for scale. So you know you remove some of the incentive if you if you don't have that kind of that, that level of scale. So I think there's you know there's there's arguments on either side. I think it is really complicated um, in in the end, um, but I, yeah, I, um, so I. I a nuanced, a nuanced issue, basically. It's not as simple as just saying yes or no. It sounds like there's exactly. a, lot, a lot of... Yeah. I think it's in the weeds, and yeah. it really depends on which problem you're trying to solve, whether breaking this stuff up like works well or not. Fair point, fair point. Um, let me shift to... Uh, so I did business in China for about 10 years, and I used to have an account on, on Douyin, which is the Chinese TikTok, and I, I didn't get kicked off. I got throttled because I, I effectively became useless because there's some things they didn't like about Douyin, actually. But... Um, 
I'll, I'll tell you, and I just for fun, I, 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 bought, I saw this video of some girl filming herself dancing. It, it, there are a million of those, right? But the video at first was made by this like kind of country bumpkin. I use that term lovingly. Guy who saw her filming by some water, and he like walked by as a passerby filming it. And I saw it because on his videos, everything else was about like potatoes or, you know, crops and stuff. And his video got like 15 million views and the actual video that she made got like 2 million. So in that case, it's just kind of funny, but it's a parallel to what I think is going on with a lot of social media writ large, where you've got somebody who's doing the original news making, uh, whether it's breaking a story, whether it's doing some research. And then it's super easy to pile on and opine. And often the pile oners and opiners mm -hmm get more views. And if we're talking about dollars now, ad dollars, you know, they get more money from that. Do we have a system that risks neglecting the, the actual news making? Should the U.S. move, and I know this is contentious, but move to more of like a BBC model or there's some, uh, you know, shared resource that actually breaks the news and then you've got opiners on top of that? Or am I just overblowing all this? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, so, I mean, you, I think you have to start with the idea that, like, news is a public good, right? Like, it's something that we need <laughs> to, to sort of function uh, as a society, particularly if you want to have some kind of informed democracy, and so, uh, and the thing about public goods is that the market doesn't always support them. And when it doesn't, you need some mechanism, like some kind of safety net there. Um, and obviously the devil's in the details with respect to how we would provide some kind of public sub sub subsidies for news. But I think, you know, the issue of market failure in news is pretty apparent at this point. So like part of the shift to digital advertising that we were, we were talking about earlier is that there's been enormous downward pressure on like the price of ads, right? So, so, the, uh, so, the, um, so that, you know, now uh, because of targeted advertising, you can reach as an advertiser the person you want to reach on any variety of sites. They could be on a recipe site or a gaming app or they could be watching, you know, a streaming video or something like that. You can reach them in all these different places. And that's very different than the market power that news organizations used to have, where I think in like 97% of the U.S. market, it was like a one newspaper town, right, where you had like all the ads and all yeah. the classifieds and stuff like that. So there's, so there's enormous competition for advertising that news organizations face. That means their old models just don't work anymore. Um, and so, and, and because there's so much more competition, the price of ads is really low. So even if you got the same audience you used to, it's not worth as much as it was when you cash it out in terms of like ad dollars and so on. So, so we've kind of reached the point where like these old models of revenue for, for newspaper news organizations don't work that well anymore. Um, a lot of, you know, the more successful organizations are, are sometimes able to sort of move to subscription models, but that that ices out a lot of people. And it also contributes to this pile on problem that you're talking about. Um, a really smart uh, like uh, CEO Charlie Tillingist once told me that you know that basically the two like the two factors that you always have to consider when you're thinking about business model in online media are like sort of uh, there is exclusivity and there's timeliness right so you know if you if you have an exclusive product that's timely like a basketball game or something like that like the NCAA can or you know or the NBA can strike like great like deals with with uh, with CBS or whichever broadcaster um, because it, to, to give the sole rights to that and that's pretty easy to monetize right because if you're the only place that can show something um, you can charge what you can charge what rent you want but um, sort of if you've got uh, a product that's timely and not exclusive and you know his example which I always love is nobody has the exclusive right to White House press conferences although <laughs> If we have another Trump administration, we'll see about that. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but the, uh, the you know so that that product's very hard to monetize because when you get to the pro when you get to the the paywall, you can just jump over to the competitor site who's doing the knockoff, who's doing the thing that's cheaper, and so on. So so I think like you know it's it's a uh, yeah. So I mean it makes it hard to charge subscriptions. It makes it hard to put up paywalls and stuff like that, which relates to the, the the you know kind of your logical endpoint here, which is that like you know. How do we, so how do we fund news organizations? And I think, you know, we can, whether you, whether, whether you want to have like fully funded, like fully publicly funded news organizations or not, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in the American media market, um, you know, because 
it, as early as we've had public broadcasters, like when they first carved out like the non-commercial licenses for broadcasting, um, you know, critics at the time in the like the uh, you know in the, the first half of the the twentieth century were saying that a, a, a basically a public broadcasting license was a license to beg. Right? We said that you can have this kind of non-commercial license, but it doesn't guarantee you any kind of funding or subsidy. Um, and even when you talk about like tax dollars going to PBS or NPR, they're vanishingly small. Like you know. They, it's like half of half of a percent or less than exactly. half a percent for NPR. Exactly. Yeah. And so when you cut the, and those mainly go to sort of making sure that people have access in like rural markets and stuff like that. Like the major, you know, the, the, the major stations are funded like in almost, enti you know, like they get the, the huge portion of their funds from their listeners and viewers and stuff like that. And that leads them to making that, that incentivizes them to make sketchy decisions at times about like sort of if the idea is that they're public uh, public service organizations that should really be serving the people who are left behind in other market contexts, the people who are, you know, the, 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 the folks whose issues aren't covered elsewhere and things like that. Um, if you're, you know, uh, you're not going to like, those are the people who, that ideally those organizations are catering to, but instead they're left basically trying to pry dollars out of wealthy contributors. Um, and so like it, you can see it reflected in the kind of programming that they have. So I think, you know, I, I think ultimately, uh, like we need to subsidize public and alternative options um, or find ways to, to sort of allow uh, sort of uh, allow uh, for profit news organ what were once for profit, profit news organizations to transfer to, uh, to trans transfer to sort of nonprofit models, provide a glide path for that that allows them to be sort of have, have different kinds of business models than they, they're right, forced to rely on. You know? Yeah. Yeah, the thought I have on this is just my own little commentary. I mean, I grew up in a, you know, we had to stand up to turn the TV, the, the, the knob, right? Because there are like four channels right. and, and everybody watched the same thing. And, and yeah, there's good and bad of that. But, but I think there's a lot of good in the sense that it was generally more neutral. I mean, yes, I mean, you know, people critique the media, media for generally having a little bit of a left leaning bias. And I think that's often true. But with the age of social media, like if I'm on the far right or if I'm on the far left, I can live my own little ecosystem. And I kind of miss those old days where like, you know, we all watch the same kind of mainstreamish thing as, as a sociological like benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, and I, I think, you know, so and I think there are people who are there. There's, I think it's fascinating to me that there's sort of, there's sort of like, there've been different eras in this kind of conversation. Um, so somebody like Cass Sunstein, the, like the, um, the policy scholar and sometimes like, like uh, sometimes a cabinet official uh, will, he, you know, he basically like sort of longs for those days where we all, you know, had that common ground that was formed by media and this idea that we're all kind of now off in our own like enclaves. Um, and, and so, and, and on the other hand, like if you look at the people who are like there at the birth of the sort of mass media era, um, like some of them, uh, it, like some of the, the famous cultural critics of the time, like Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno or whatnot, they were talking about basically the way that it sort of cheapened <laughs> culture basically for the purpose of mass appeal. Um, and so I think like, you know, there's discontents to every model, but certainly like, you know, a, a having common ground and a common set of like sort of, uh, a common set of, of facts and, and, you know, kind of a common purpose is, uh, is, is definitely something that it would be, it would, we would hope we can work toward, um, in our media system, media ecosystem. Um, yeah. And so definitely. Well put, well put, uh, two more like lightning round, quick sure. questions, AI and journalism, good, bad, neutral. How do you feel about it in a, in a, in a summary? Yeah. You know, so when I mean, we were at the same conference a while back and one of the things that I thought was really interesting is the way that uh, some of the, some of the AI is being used in uh, fact checking, right. To like, uh, to, to surface, um, thing to surface like sort of uh, like the, the things that maybe most need to be fact checked when their inbox has 10,000 things in it in the morning um, or to sort of uh, to, to uh, like or to like find um, if you know something some recurring pro like piece of problematic information is coming up it can help help them dig up uh, like sort of previously written fact checks that they can adapt or even or, or even like sort of pull in statistics that are like uh, that are that, sort of, <laughs> that the AI can reliably grasp without like sort of fabricating or so on. Um, you know, so there, it's interesting to me, it was interesting to me to say that like there are kind of two sides in this Cold War where it's like, you know, it, it may make it that much easier to create sock puppet accounts and disinformation channels and so on and so forth. But there are also people uh, working on the other side of the equation to sort of use AI in ways that benefit um, the, the, to the benefit of journalism. And of course, the, the other kind of piece of this is all the, the intellectual property and copyright issues like, you know, that, that, that when when journalism yeah, it feeds into the dollar, yeah. 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 
what's next up for you on the research front here? Yeah, so, um, so I'm, I'm trying <laughs> eternally to finish uh, my book on the, the civic impacts of media distribution. Um, and I'm going to be working uh, with uh, Raven Mara Lloyd um, uh, who's, uh, it, it, uh, on a, uh, a textbook on sort of uh, media technology and culture, basically. So those are the those are the two projects that I have on the horizon. I'm still interested in the questions of like ad tech and disinformation and that type of thing. I'm kind of casting around to figure out what's next with that. And the conference we were just at, I think, will be helpful in that regard. Yeah, Cambridge Disinformation Summit was excellent. Um, finally, if someone wants more of uh, Father Figure Joshua Braun, where can they go? Um, so I have a um, I, I moved my website over to the university hosting since it works pretty well. So they can go to uh, joshbraun.umasscreate.net um, is the is the sort of um, is the university's web hosting for for faculty. Um, that, that, that's my address there, and I'm happy to send you the link. Sure, and I'll put that in the show notes underneath uh, the video. So, Professor Braun, you've been very generous with your time and your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining us. And to you at home watching, thanks as always. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>